Let's start with one famous event in the life of Jesus, his baptism by John the Baptist. Now, believe it or not, many people who argue for an historical Jesus t tell the world that the bedrock of an historical Jesus rests on two things. Two things that are beyond doubt. You have to be a nutter to doubt them. One of them is his crucifixion. Right? How can we doubt that? We've got Christianity. Something must have happened, crucifixion. That's the proof of that. The other thing on which Jesus rests is the baptism. So here he is being baptised by John the Baptist in, as we know, the Jordan. Now, the synoptic Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark and, uh, and Luke, give very little information as to where. We simply know Jesus went to the wilderness and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Here's what we're talking about. And if you go to Israel anytime soon, you can go to a place called Yardenit, Yardenit, on the Jordan, where you can purchase one of these lovely white smocks and be baptised in the Jordan like Jesus. Nice little venue. Has everything you could wish for. It's what you would expect a baptism site of Jesus to be. Delightful place. If I tell you something like half a million tourists and pilgrims visit this place every year, well, you can see it just oozes sanctity. The only problem with Yardenit was established years and years ago, like 1981. Before that, it didn't exist. This is not an historical venue. What is it then? What happened is in 1967 there was a war and that area of the Jordan, traditionally associated with Jesus, was filled up with mines. It became a very hostile frontier place and off the tourist map. Now that was shut, that area was shut off to tourists until only a few years ago. So the Israeli government and the Israeli Ministry of Tourism obviously thought about this issue, they were losing lots of very valuable dollars, and so they created a baptism site to meet the needs, primarily I guess, of American Christians who wanted to touch the authentic venue of Jesus event. Now, let's tell you a little bit more about Yardenit. Where is it? If you know your geography, that little lake at the top there is known as Sea of Galilee. And down the bottom there, that longest stretch of water is the Dead Sea. Now, Yardenit is just outside the outflow from the Sea of Galilee, up in the top corner there. So that's where they built this Ertzatz baptism site to please the tourists. The traditional site was where the Jordan goes into the Dead Sea. Now, that was the traditional site. So, having put into your mind the fact that because of politics, because of economic and political factors, the government of the day established a fake site for baptism in the north. Let's go and have a look at the site that was established long ago in the south. That's the, just the top end of the Dead Sea, and this is the traditional site for Jesus' baptism. How do we know that? Well, only one of the Gospels refers to where Jesus was baptised, and that's the last of an interesting point, the earlier ones don't have any idea. The last of them is so damn good at it, it has two places. The place that Jesus was baptised by John the Baptist was Bethany across the Jordan. That's what the Gospel of Gentiles. Bethany across the Jordan, in other words, on the eastern flank of the Jordan. And that's where the original sites for the baptism were marked out. And that's what the Jordan looks like now nearer to its authentic baptism site. Clearly it's not a very appetising place. This is the earlier site where pilgrims went to have their communion with Jesus. If in the 20th century we can have a fake Jesus theme park created, is it at all possible that back in the days of the Byzantine Empire they might have done the self-same thing? Well, I'm going to give you the answer. Way down south, at a place called the Bridge of King Abdullah. This is an original marking stone for the authentic traditional site of the baptism of Jesus. So this is even further south than the, the, the one we just saw. So you can see we're getting a proliferation of the authentic sites of Jesus because clearly 
The clue here is if you have an authentic holy site, you're onto a winner. You make money. Pilgrims need services. As fortune would have it, we have evidence from what the Byzantines got up to. Not far from the River Jordan, in Jordan, the country of Jordan, there is something known as the Mosaic of Madaba. It's a church, and the floor of this church, about the size of this room, is covered with a mosaic of the Eastern Mediterranean world. Very lovely thing. It dates from the 6th century. And what it shows is what the Byzantines in the 6th century thought was the authentic baptism site of Jesus. Now, we have written testimony, actually earlier still. From the 2nd century, we have a churchman called Origen who said he couldn't find Bethany across the Jordan. He couldn't find it. He was looking. He came up with an alternative name, Bethabara. And you can see within that red circle, in the paler colour, Be Bethabara. This is his alternative offering for Bethany. He couldn't find it, even in the second century. So he suggests something else, and it's recorded on the map. And it says, Bethabara, the site where Jesus was baptised by John. Across at the top there, you'll see uh, some more letters. Because the second place that John offers for the baptism of Jesus was called Anon near Salim. The best they can get is that place. That is an Anon, because the, the word Anon just means spring. Spring near, and the name there is, is totally different. It's Septuagathia. It's a different town. So this is where they placed the second one. But notice what's happening here. John gives a certain testimony. What shows up on the map? You'll notice Bethabara is not beyond the Jordan. It's actually on the other bank. So it's not only a different name, it's in a different place. And they've stuck something else the other side of the river. On the same map, further up the river, hedging their bets, they put another anion. And they're saying, this is also where John baptised. So I hope you get the message here. What they are doing is dotting places where they can. Is their choice random? Or is it based on anything authentic? Well, if we remember that earlier one, what is the case here? The northern shore, something special happened there according to Jewish scripture. What happened? Elijah ascended to heaven. Now, who is the new Elijah? Why, it's John the Baptist. So they had a holy site, and so, of course, it's the obvious choice to put the new holy site. So they stamp the new one on top of the old one. And that is a clue to what they've done throughout the Holy Land. If they don't know anywhere, they go to somewhere else. And the thing about Bethabara, right, why that is chosen? This, believe it or not, is where the Israelites entered the Promised Land. So how auspicious, the very same spot where the Israelites tramped across the River Jordan, is where Jesus goes to be baptised. Because, of course, Jesus replaces everything about what went before. If you want to understand how they wrote the Gospels, here's a replacement for everything that went before. So none of the places chosen are random. They have a very specific reason. Let's finish this off, this little bit about baptism. I like this particular story. John the Baptist, poor old guy, he gets his head cut off, doesn't he? We all know the story about the dance of Salome, a drunken king, he's having a birthday party with his pals, and he says to her, anything you want, up to half my kingdom. And what does she do? Because her, her dastardly mother puts her up to it, I want the head of John the Baptist, right? We all know that lovely story, it produces some beautiful art. As it happens, we have some information about the John the Baptist from the Jewish historian Josephus, a first century historian, which we use a lot today, and certainly the Christians used a lot when they were writing their Gospels. And Josephus says, John was a good man. He was arrested by Herod Antipas because they thought he would start a rebellion, and he put him in prison, and this is the prison. It was a castle top on a place called Mancherus. This is a castle right down in the south, near towards the border with the, the Arabs. And uh, this is where John was in prison and eventually had his head cut off. Let's go back and look at the map. Herod's palace 
was in Tiberias. This is his capital city. This is a Romanized city on the lake, of, on the Sea of Galilee. This is where he would have had his nobles for his birthday party. And if you remember the story, he sends out for the head of John the Baptist. Now I put it to you, could you, between the main course and your dessert, get somebody to go down 80 miles to this fortress in the south, arrange to cut off somebody's head and bring it back to the banquet to present to the king. I think by then your dinner would have got cold. So that scene of Herod being presented with a head, it just is not possible, unless they waited and waited and waited for about five days. Okay, so you can see how the story is ridiculous, but also the geography doesn't support it. 